Welcome to New York City and Mission City Church. We're here to connect people with God and with each other. We hope you're encouraged by this week's message. I want to ask you a question. Do you ever hope for someday? Someday this, someday that. Um, Do you ever hope for someday? And by that I mean, do you have an expectation? Do you have an expectation of any kind? Um, Is there something that you would say, you know what? Someday it's going to be like this, or maybe someday it'll be like that, or maybe someday it'll be different, or maybe someday. We all have a tendency to do this. Um, In fact, I think there are three different kinds. They're going to pop up on the screen for you. Um, One kind of someday is a small someday. So there's such a thing as a small someday. So a small someday or a small hope is, uh, you know, something that doesn't necessarily mean a ton. For instance, um, when I was a child, I would say someday my team is going to win it all. Um, I'm 34 years old. My team still has never won at all. Um, I no longer say someday my team will win at all because my team just doesn't win at all. In fact, this starts to introduce, you know, the, the, the dark side of someday, right? So uh, the dark side of someday is you can get disappointed. Uh, and disappointment is uh, maybe just a little farther than disillusionment, a little shy of depression, But at some point, our disappointment can graduate all the way into jadedness where we say, you know what, I don't say someday anymore. Like, I just quit saying someday. I don't say someday. I don't hope anymore. You know, it's not, it doesn't feel safe emotionally, you know, to say someday anymore. And now we haven't even really escalated uh, the matter yet. We're still talking about small someday's, you know, maybe someday this, maybe someday, you know, my roommate will not do that. Or maybe one day my mom, maybe someday my mom will not do that or what have you. These are small someday's that we hope in and we go through our little roller coasters of expectation and disappointment without a ton of consequence. But then there are big someday's, big hopes, big dreams, big things we think in our head that like somewhere out there in the future, maybe someday it'll be the way we want it to be. Uh, a bigger someday would sound something like, okay, maybe, maybe someday I'll be well. Maybe someday I'll feel physically well. Maybe someday I'll be able to be in public without worrying about a tragedy like the one our city endured this very week. Maybe someday, that's a big want, that's a big hope. Maybe someday I'll be able to like check my news app without like a, that, that flare up of anxiety before you actually put your thumb down on the button, wondering what you're about to see. You know, maybe someday, maybe someday I'll find someone to share life with. Uh, Maybe someday wars like the one in Eastern Europe right now will cease. Maybe someday there will be peace, real peace. Now, these are much bigger somedays. These are much bigger expectations. These are much bigger desires that we feel um, in our hearts. And we all have a relationship with these. We all have our set of somedays from the small. You know, maybe someday the trains will run on time. That's small. You think it's big in the moment. I promise that's a small one. Um, But then there are the bigger ones, you know. Um, the bigger some days. But then I think there's one more step up the ladder um, in terms of what we can hope for or feel disappointed by. And those are the ultimate ones, the ultimate some days, you know, someday, someday. I think there's an ultimate version of this too, not just small, not just big. I think there's some ultimate ones, like the ones that have to do with God, like the ones that go like this, maybe someday I'll have a strong faith, you know, or maybe someday um, I'll feel peace in my heart. Maybe one day I'll know my life counted for something. Maybe one day I'll feel unguilty about that thing that happened or that thing I did or was done to me. Maybe one day I'll feel clean. Maybe one day I'll feel confident. Maybe one day I'll feel comfortable in my own skin. Maybe one day I can feel forgiven. And maybe one day I can know how to make the precious minutes of my life go for something eternal. Maybe one day. These are ultimate. These are the ultimate some days. Far beyond the frivolous little hopes about our sports teams, and even far beyond the big, the big hopefuls of our circumstance, or our relational life, or our physical life, or our career, or what have you, there's still those ultimate questions that somehow in the rush of the small and big some days, the small and big expectations and disappointment rhythms, somehow we never get around to the ultimate ones. We kind of put those on the, on the back burner sometimes and think, you know what, maybe I'll get around to that someday. But unreflectively, we're all engaging in these things all the time. We all have a relationship. We all have a relationship with someday. Are you hopeful on the subjects of your life? Small, medium, small, big, and ultimate. Are you jaded in small, big, and ultimate ways? In what ways do you interact with someday? In what ways do you interact with disappointment? You know, um, there's a scripture that I find so accurate to the emotional life. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. It's an ancient proverb, 3,000-year-old wisdom from the Word of God. Hope deferred 
makes the heart sick. Meaning, when you hope in something, and then you have to push it away again and again. And you hope in something, but oh, you have to defer it. You got to kick the can of hope down the road again and again. That does something to us emotionally. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Of course, we've done, at this point, um, hundreds, dozens and dozens and hundreds even of clinical studies. And now we've got psychologists who study the realities of disappointment confirming again and again that when you hope, but then you have to defer your hope, and you have to kick it down the road again and again, it does make the heart sick. There is something, um, there is something that goes wrong inside of us. There's something that breaks inside of us. We lose, it's possible to lose something and not get it back um, in our relationship to someday. Um, so depending on where you're at in your stage of life, depending on where you're at in the various areas of your life, whether it be business, relationship, or what have you, we are all in a relationship with maybe someday it will be better. Do we have that idea in our heads or have we already broken up with it? Today, we are going to go to the, the ultimate of ultimate hopes. And we're going to see, of course, the risen Christ remind us, show us, and let it fall afresh on our hearts that maybe every single circumstantial dream that we've ever had might not come true on our terms. However, the most ultimate and important thing is enough to fill our hearts with joy, to fill our hearts with peace, to give us strength for today, and to be able to know that someday um, things will be right and as they should be, and that the deepest desires of your heart and mine, the deepest desires of your heart and mine can be fulfilled in his presence starting today and lasting forever and ever and ever. That is what Easter is about. So with these words in mind, um, let's interact a little bit here. Um, we're going to pick up the story uh, where two of Jesus' disciples on the first Easter, on the original Easter, the day when he rose from the grave, two of his disciples are leaving Jerusalem. Now, why would they do that? Because um, the people who killed Jesus were really not interested in his following continuing. That's why they killed Jesus. They didn't want his following to continue. Consequently, they would have been very prone, very trigger happy, if you will, to make sure that the followers of Jesus did not have any reason to continue meeting together, being together, or exerting influence on the world. So if you were a follower of Jesus and Jesus dies, you've pinned your ultimate, ultimate hopes on this person as believing that he's God, and then he dies, which puts a stop to that belief very quickly. And then you think, well, the people who killed him, they may be coming for me next, so we better leave Jerusalem. All right, so that's where we're at. But there were some rumors going around that Jesus had actually risen from the grave. They were unconfirmed at that point to these two people. So we're going to see here two disappointed followers of Jesus, people who had signed up to follow Jesus, um, but ultimately were walking away in defeat. All right, so we're going to pick up the conversation with them right here. That very day, the first Easter, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. So this is a long walk. Okay, this is like an hour and a half, two-hour drive. Okay, so if you picture like, you know, an hour and a half, two-hour drive with your friends or your family, um, and you just went through something crazy, you know what you're going to be doing? You're going to be talking with each other about all these things that have happened. So they are walking and they're debriefing just as we would all the things that have gone on of late. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself, it says, drew near and went with them. So um, I think Jesus uh, has a sense of humor on Easter. If you read the gospel accounts, it just seems like he's interested in not only revealing himself, but revealing himself in kind of unexpected ways that kind of make us smile even 2,000 years later. So he pulls up, uh, it says, their eyes were kept from recognizing him, but then he said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? What are you guys talking about? You know, totally playing dumb, 100% playing dumb, like he doesn't know exactly what they're talking about. And they stood still looking sad. In other words, this question was considered so dumb in the one hand, because everybody knew what was going on in Jerusalem, and so heart-wrenching that they were walking, talking, and when Jesus said, what are you guys talking about? They literally stopped and looked at him like, what? They were sad. And when it says, sometimes the Bible uses understatements, by the way, um, they were crushed and confused because they had cosmically hoped, okay? They didn't hope a little in Jesus. They hadn't hoped even big time in Jesus. They had hoped cosmically in Jesus, they had said you. They had seen the words that he had said, uh, confirming truth in their hearts. He had. They had seen the miracles that Jesus had done. They had watched him heal, and they had watched him confirm every claim that he'd ever made and backed it up. And then all of a sudden, he's dead. Then all of a sudden, he's dead, just dead, and unable, unable, evidently to save himself. So they are. They. 
they're never going to trust again. One thing's for sure. They are never, they're probably walking down the street thinking like, okay, we just saw the most amazing things. He said he was God, and then he died. I'm never going to believe my eyes. Maybe I'm like locked in a padded room somewhere right now. I trust nothing. This, they are on the express train to the next time the census comes around, checking under religion, none. Okay, they are done. They are out. There is no way they would ever trust anything again. And they are moving on. They are literally, they're like, what is life? What's life? We use that phrase sometimes whenever we just are exaggerating. You know, it's raining and my umbrella's broken and the coffee shop's out of espresso. What is life? You don't mean that, okay? They, on this day, were at a point where they're like, what is life? Like, what is life actually? And who is God? Who am I? What do I do with this? So one of them breaks the silence named Cleopas and answered Jesus, are you the only person, a <laughs> um, little rude here, but that's okay, are you the only person in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus continuing his line, what things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped... He was the one to redeem Israel. Feel the psychological power of those words. We had hoped he was the one. We had hoped he was the one. The one, the one. Like the ultimate one, the son of God. We had hoped he was the one. And you can feel that cosmic someday. Some, God has visited his people. It's today. And then all of a sudden it's all gone. We had hoped. These are hard people to reach. Do you know who the hardest people to reach with the message of Jesus are? Do you know? It's people who already think they've graduated from it. The hardest people to reach with the message of Jesus are people who think, yeah, I've tried that, I've hoped in that, and I've already kind of moved on. They're already walking away, they've already got their mind made up, and they are on the straight path to skepticism, and they are just about done. This is how skeptics are made, and they are in a place where they're like, I am not leadable. I think this is, broadly speaking, by the way, the nature of, of the modern West, um, I know the modern West would be billions of people, so you can't paint in, in such a broad stroke. But I will tell you um, that though there are exceptions, of course, there are, there are vibrant Christians in the West and always will be. And there are also non-Christians in the West and probably always will be. However, um, there is a dominant trend in the modern West away from Christianity towards none, away from following the person of Jesus towards nothing, towards none. Both Christian and non-Christian research search groups have confirmed that we're in a societal place, a societal place of where these people are individually, a societal place of saying, we've already hoped, like we already hoped in him, and we're kind of moving on. So what do you say to such a culture? What do you say to such people? How do you approach this? And if you take a page out of Jesus's book, it seems to be head on. So here he comes. Um, and he said to them, oh, foolish ones, which is just so polite and cultured and kind, you know, oh, foolish ones. Um, and, and slow of heart, you're slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So he's reaching back into the Old Testament. And he's saying, you know what's going wrong here? You are forgetting what was written down. And what was written down is that was it not necessary, this is what's written, that it was necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and then enter his glory. So suffering first, glory next. It was predicted in the Old Testament. That's what I was embodying. And when you saw suffering at the cross event on Friday... You should not have thought, well, I guess plan's off. You should have thought, we are right on track. We are right on track here. Pain comes first and then glory, okay? First the cross and then the resurrection. Not to mention, not only was this prophesied in the Old Testament, but Jesus himself pulled them aside three times and told them, look, guys, when we go to Jerusalem, they're going to put me on a cross. I'm going to die, and three days later, I'm going to come again. Everybody good? And they, they weren't good. Like, they didn't get it. They forgot the whole thing, and they're losing their mind. And Jesus says, didn't you remember that suffering comes first, that Friday was necessary to come not only before Sunday, but because of Sunday. Friday, Jesus reminds them, was the preview for Sunday. Friday, meaning suffering, metaphor for suffering. Friday, suffering, was the preview for Sunday. Suffering had to come and prompted and even promised that Sunday was still coming. You see, when they saw Friday, the original disciples, despite having advance warning, when they saw Friday, they thought, Oh, pain and suffering? So the plan must be off. And Jesus corrects them and says, when you saw pain and suffering, you should have thought, we're right in the middle of the plan. We're right in the middle of the plan. And I think this mistake, we forget this as we interact with our world. We see pain, we see suffering, and we think, oh, I guess the plan's off. I guess God's not coming. 
I guess he's not governing this world. I guess he's not sovereign. I guess he's not providential. I guess he's not kind. We make the same mistake they did. We look at pain and suffering and think, well, we're just off track and God is like not guiding the universe. But just as Jesus reminded them on that first Easter, the suffering always comes before glory. Just because glory hasn't come to this planet and our very lives in every way we long for it to does not mean that God's kindness and plan are off at all. And not only this, but Jesus makes it so clear that this has everything to do with us. That's why he's interacting with individuals, to make sure they know it has to do with them. Because it's not just that Jesus did an impressive thing and had to suffer before his glory. This has everything to do with us because his glory, his resurrection, is a preview of ours. In other words, Sunday is the preview for someday. The resurrection of Jesus, his Sunday, his resurrection, is a preview for our someday. So every one of those ultimate hopes that you have, every one of those deep longings in your heart that you have for fulfillment and satisfaction and to no purpose and to no certainty and to no meaning and to, to know that your life counts, every single one of those for joy, for fulfillment, for all of the things that you want, the creator of the heavens and the earth put those desires in you and you're longing for someday, not because you're not going to get it, but because you will. Sunday, the resurrection of Christ does not mean that those desires are fulfilled right now. It means that they will be someday. His resurrection is a preview of the resurrected reality that he's going to make a new heavens and a new earth, and he's going to make a place where you will never have to say someday again because everything you need, the deepest desires of your heart and mind, will be fulfilled right there on the spot. And the resurrection of Christ is meant to tell us and show us eternally that someday is still on. Your ultimate hopes are still intact. Yes, the world is insane. Yes, it's, in, it's discouraging. And the cross was discouraging too. Were we done then? No. So we're not done now. And someday is still on track. We are right in the middle of where God, not, not where God morally intends us to be. We're in a fallen world. But providentially, this thing is moving in the direction that he wants it to ultimately go for his fame and his glory. Don't let, don't let deferring your hope. When you see this world and you think, oh, maybe someday I'll be able to get on the subway without thinking twice. Don't, and then you think, oh, well, I guess maybe, maybe someday. No, you know, not today, not this week. And, we, and as that hope gets deferred and you feel that darkness settle over your soul, what we need is a reminder on Easter and every day that someday is still intact and there is a world coming where you will not have to ever think and your children will not have to ever think of such things because someday is still on. Someday is still going to happen. It says in Romans 6, 5, For if we have been united with him in a death like his, meaning we suffered, we shall certainly be reunited with him in a resurrection like his. So his empty tomb is a preview of your empty tomb. You know, this is why it's really important to have a really literal, historical, factual resurrection. A literal, historical, factual resurrection. I'm not up here talking about metaphors, okay? This is not a figure of speech. He didn't, um, he didn't rise in our minds, okay? He actually rose. Like he rose up the elevator to come to this building. That's how firm and real Jesus rose out of the tomb. This is not a metaphor. If you're, you know, if the, if the resurrection's a metaphor, maybe your someday's a metaphor. You know, who knows, okay? So we need a factual, actual resurrection of Jesus, and that's exactly what we've got. And the, and the New Testament, by the way, will take no other answer. If you've got some other kind of resurrection, some, some kind of version working in your head of like, Maybe it's not literal, it's just part of my tradition. Okay, you do not have the faith. Like, you, you're, you've moved somewhere else. Like, the faith is that he actually rose again. If you've moved to, like, you know what, maybe the resurrection is more of, a, more of an illustrative example of a legend or something. No, you're off. Like, you've moved away from Christianity. You've moved away from the faith because we have a literal and actual and a factual resurrection of Christ. And that tells us, because that's real and hard and fast, that tells us that his Sunday is a preview for our someday and that all the hopes we've deferred and all the disappointments we felt in life and all the bitterness that grips our soul is not going to be there forever. This is when a person loses hope. This is when a person loses hope is when they think it's going to be like this forever. It's going to be broken forever. That is a powerful idea. That is a powerfully dark idea. If you think it's going to be bad forever, that will break your spirit and you will not be able to move forward. But if Sunday was a preview for someday, then that will give you strength for today. So faith in someday then must be the key to strength today. So this directly relates to you being confident and knowing that 
Jesus will return to this planet and make it right, that you have a real future with God. My goodness, if you only have a present with earth, I'd be depressed too, okay? If I only had a present uh, ability to interact with this world as it is, I'm not impressed. Like, <laughs> you know, the, the world is just not impressive, okay? It's not an impressive place. However, if there is a world coming where I'm going to be face-to-face -face with my creator without shame, without imperfection, without sin, and that is going to come, whether tomorrow or whether in a thousand years, I don't know, but if that's going to come and I will be there, then I can pass through a broken world with joy. I can pass through a broken world with strength. If I think someday's not coming, I don't know what my emotional state's going to do. I'll be honest with you. I don't know what your emotional state's going to do. I could probably guess that it's going to tank because we think we're stuck with this broken world forever and it only goes where it goes we don't know but if we know that Jesus is coming to restore it that makes all the difference today listen to him in his own words before he was betrayed and crucified L listen to him use this someday faith for strength today to create peace he says let not your hearts be troubled trust in God believe in God believe also in me in my father's house okay this is someday this is where you're going someday um, in my father's house are many rooms if it were not, meaning there's room for you. If it were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? Jesus is like, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm not going to say that I'm going to go to heaven and build a world for you and bring it here to earth and make it a physical reality that we all embody one day. I wouldn't just say that and lie to you. And if I am going indeed to prepare that place for you, I will come again. Earlier in this passage, he also said, I will not leave you as orphans. I will not leave you standing there waiting on me. I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am you may be also. Impact for your emotional life is a paragraph down below. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you, meaning with uncertainty attached. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So he's using, his fu he's using the future someday that we all want. He's using the future world that we all want, a world without financial pressures, without fear, without doubt, without breakups, without divorces, without disease, without sickness, um, without fear, without public acts of terror, without suppression of belief, just uh, the world we all want, the world you want and the world I want. He's saying it is going to come, so don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. His suffering led to his resurrection. His resurrection guarantees our resurrection and because we have hope in that, we can live in this unresurrected world today. And that is, how the, that is how the strength for today can enter into your heart and enter into your mind. You know, I don't know what disappointments you've endured in your life. Um, it may be that you thought, um, it may be that you got confused with your faith. It may be that even when it comes to Jesus, you thought, hmm, because of Easter, because of his resurrection, my someday gets to be today. And you deleted suffering from the present world because you thought in a fit of Christian optimism that everything was going to be great and that everything was going to be perfect. And I want to tell you, I've been to a lot of Christian funerals. I've read the Lazarus story. Jesus tells him to get up. I've read the resurrection over and over again. Jesus gets up. I've never seen a Christian funeral end in anything other than the funeral. I've never seen a shocking ending. I've never seen a resurrection. Okay? However, that's because the story of Lazarus being raised from the grave and the story of, most importantly, of Jesus being raised from the grave are not meant to normalize an expectation that everything is going to be miraculously perfect today. But it's a preview that it will be one day, that it certainly will be one day. And so when you defer your hopes, when you defer your hopes and you say, okay, this world isn't as it should be and that's creating a little bit of disappointment for me, be careful how far down the road you're going to kick that hope. Like, where are you going to put it? Are you going to say, someday is off? God's plan is off? Jesus is not real? Jesus is not coming back? This world will never improve? Are you going that far? Or are you in a place where you can say, okay, it's not what it should be today. I'm not what I should be today. But one day, with certainty, with certainty, everything will be exactly what it should be. With certainty. Because of what he did. Because of his resurrection. Because he went into the grave, and then got up and walked and talked among us, hundreds of people, the New Testament says, confirming, confirming that this really took place. You think about this for a second. How come, you know, some people ask, well, how come the resurrection is so unique? Like, how do we know? Like, how do we know that we know? And some people say, don't people die for their beliefs all the time? I mean, don't, I mean the early Christians, they died for their beliefs, but don't people die for their beliefs all the time? 
Right. The difference is the early Christians didn't die for their beliefs. They died for what they said they saw. They died for what they said they saw. Not for what they heard about and not for some doctrinal statement that they signed, but they, they, they died for what they believed because they had seen a dead man walking. They saw with their own eyes hundreds of people in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago saw a man not only do miraculous deeds, but then die. And then the same guy verified, blue check mark, verified, is walking around talking to people. And that lit the world on fire. And 2,000 years later, it might, as well have been, it might as well have been two minutes ago. Because if God can do this at any point in time, then he can make this world be what it should be at any point in time. Forever is coming. Forever is coming. It will be good. It will be good. And you can have strength today because we see these things as real and firm and true. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, all of our hopes are only rightly given to you. All of our hopes can only rightly be pinned on you. Everything else will disappoint. Every other relationship will disappoint. Every other person, Christian or not, will disappoint. Everything disappoints us except you. Everything disappoints us except you. And you fulfill our hearts. You give us joy. You give us strength. You give us peace. You give us firmness. You give us the ability to stay the ability to not run, the ability to face everything from the world to our news app, to our own emotions, to our own guilt, to our own sense of failure, to our own anxieties. Lord, you give us strength for everything. And we know that even though everything is not yet as it should be according to your moral will, we are not losing hope because we know that you lived the life we could not live You fulfilled every law. You fulfilled every moral excellence that we failed. You lived a holy life. You spoke the truth among us in a way that just startled us and spoke to our condition. You did miracles to confirm. You fed 5,000 people with just a handful of loaves and fish. You healed people who could not be healed, we thought. And Lord, you did it all, not to show us in the year 2022 that you're going to do that every single time we have a human need. Not yet, but that one day you certainly would. And just as you miraculously fed and healed some as a preview and a down payment that was to come, one day you will heal and you will strengthen and you will feed all eternally. Lord, for anyone who is discouraged because some part of their life disappeared, whether it was a Uh, a a, a job, a career, an opportunity, just some sort of hope and the door slammed shut. Lord, remind them that the world that is coming has something that is so much deeper and so much better that is truly fulfilling. Lord, fill our hearts with the strength that we need to live in a Saturday world that is pre-glory, but to know glory is on its way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for being with us. If these messages are strengthening you in your faith, we want to hear from you. Find us online at missioncity.nyc or email us at info at missioncity.nyc so we can celebrate everything God's doing in your life. We'll see you next week.